We're going to get going with the, the, our, our next panel here about uh, the Gulf. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michael Singh. I'm the Managing Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Fred and the Atlantic Council and Ian for inviting me to host, uh, or to moderate, I should say, this uh, panel, which is a very distinguished panel. Um, I'm not going to give an a opening presentation except to say that, uh, you know, despite all this talk, which I hear of a pivot to Asia, um, uh, reading the newspapers, you know, my, my good friend and my colleague, uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, has a class, I think, at George Washington, and he has his students read the newspapers every morning and count how many stories are about the Middle East versus the rest of the world. Uh, it usually ends up being about 10 on the Middle East and two or three on the rest of the world. So uh, with all apologies to Barry and his panel, which is coming up next, uh, this talk of a pivot age is oversold, I think. And I'm not just saying that because I run a Middle East think tank. Um, <laughs> the, the truth is there are key U.S. interests in the Middle East, and I think this came out very strongly uh, in the last presidential campaign, whether it's uh, our interest in energy security and the stability of the Gulf, which is an interest we share uh, with partners around the world, not just in the region, or whether it's our worries about the threat posed by proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons coming from Iran especially. Um, it's an area of the world which remains absolutely vital to U.S. national security and to the security of our allies. And that's reflected uh, in, for example, our foreign military sales in the region. Uh, from 2007 to 2010, the Gulf alone, not the whole Middle East, just the Gulf, uh, was 27 percent of U.S. global foreign military sales. And obviously, missile defense was a very large portion of that. Uh, I would say it was even higher in 2012, though I don't have the statistic off the top of my head. Maybe Matt does. Um, so obviously, this is a, this is a region where, uh, which is very important for U.S. security, very important for this topic. Uh, and so we're going to delve into that a little bit. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit more background about myself, I'll admit up front I'm not a technical expert on missile defense uh, or on uh, military issues more broadly. I'm sort of a policy guy. Um, and uh, in particular, I focused on Iran, which uh, I think my, my close friends would tell you is a part of a broader tendency to be part of the problem rather than the solution. Um, my, my background uh, is as uh, Senior Director for the Middle East at the National Security Council, uh, and before that, working as a Special Assistant to uh, two Secretaries of State, which is sort of a fancy way of saying that I carried Colin Powell's dry cleaning around to many places in the world. Um, and, and that's, that's me. Uh, but uh, my co-panelists here are far more distinguished uh, than I. And let me introduce them uh, from the left inward here. Uh, Vice Admiral Kevin Cosgriff, retired. Uh, Admiral Cosgriff is Senior Vice President for International Business and Government at Textron Systems uh, and a member of the Textron Systems Executive Leadership Team. He was Commander of U.S. Naval Forces Central Command. Uh, he was also, at the same time, commanding the U.S. Fifth Fleet and the Combined Maritime Forces. Uh, and he has a long history of U.S. government, uh, including stints as Deputy Commander of U.S. Fleet Forces in Norfolk, uh, and at the White House as Director of the Situation Room and as a Director on the NSC staff, uh, which is now the NSS staff. Uh, sitting next to him is Matt Spence, Dr. Matt Spence, uh, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Middle East Policy. Uh, in which capacity he's the principal advisor to Secretary Hagel and Under Secretary Miller, whom you heard from uh, earlier today, on international security strategy and policy in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Spence, Matt, served before as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for International Economics uh, at the National Security Council, uh, and also before that has a uh, sort of long academic and think tank career uh, on his resume. And sitting immediately to my left, is uh, my good friend uh, and the ambassador from the United Arab Emirates, uh, Ambassador Yusuf al Taiba. Uh, he's been the ambassador from the UAE since July 2008. Uh, before that, he served for seven years as director of international affairs uh, for um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, who's the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and also the Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, Yusuf has been working on this issue, I know, for a long time. Uh, when we began with the Gulf Security Dialogue uh, and well into the present era. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Spence uh, to begin. Great. Thanks very much, Mike, and thank you to the Atlanta Council for, uh, for the invitation to be on the panel. It's good seeing my friend Barry Pavel here. We spent a lot of time working together at the NSC, and in particular on missile defense, uh, and on the Ballistic Missile Defense Review, which by the end of it, uh, we were both convinced that BMDR definitely was a four-letter word. 
It took uh, quite a amount of time, and, uh, but it was great working together. Uh, what I wanted to do is just offer a little bit of context about uh, the strength of our relationship with the GCC and the Gulf states, of which I think is important to understand uh, how ballistic missile defense falls into why it's so, such a strong uh, US priority. I know Jim Miller spoke this morning about the Iranian threat, which is a key context that we think about with all this. But I think it's the depth of the collaboration with our partners in the Gulf make both our bilateral BMD cooperation and what we attempt to do multilaterally so important. You know, it was no accident that my first trip uh, in this job was to UAE. It's no accident that Secretary Panetta went to GCC countries three times last year. And it's also no accident that on Secretary Kerry's first visit as Secretary of State, he went to several GCC countries. I think it underscores, in addition to the depth of our foreign military sales, the depth of our broad exercises with uh, US CENTCOM, of which last fall we hosted the largest ever naval exercise, uh, and on interoperability, which underscores the depth of our cooperation. And in, as Yusuf uh, you know, sits next to me, I'm going mean, to run to the fact that UE, for example, participated in five coalition operations with the United States in the last 20 years. I think if I have it right, there were over 2,000 combat air missions flown over Libya and, uh, and a significant number flown out of Kandahar and Afghanistan as well. So I think that's the context that we're, we're looking at and why today. Very briefly, I just wanted to talk about three things to kick it off. Talk a little bit about the history of ballistic missile defense in the region, uh, which helps states the frame of where we are today. Talk a little bit about our current efforts with multilateral cooperation, and then talk a little more about some of the key issues we're thinking about going forward. Uh, as we think about the last 30 years, if you look at the genesis of the GCC until now, we've really seen tremendous levels of cooperation, both bilaterally as well as multilaterally. You know, ballistic missiles have been a key part of a threat for the region for quite some time. I think we all remember from the Iran-Iraq war amply demonstrated the threat uh, that belligerents can have from ballistic missiles and uh, the need to take important and concrete steps to address it. It was really for that reason that as we went into the 1991 Gulf War, we led the United States to deploy our first Patriot batteries uh, to Saudi Arabia as part of the coalition uh, against Iraq. And I think at the time, it was nearly 50 Scud missiles were landed in Saudi Arabia, making in concrete uh, relief for all of us just what needed to be done. Now, now, this had two parts. I think to our enemies in the region, it extended our resolve to defend against the threat. And then to our GCC partners, it demonstrated our commitment to work uh, in close collaboration with them to pursue and prevent the ballistic missile threat. Uh, and I think the period after the Gulf War, we saw some significant bilateral developments uh, there to increase the capabilities of our partners. You know, through our foreign military sales, uh, the GCC states, including Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, have invested hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to Patriot batteries and with progressive technology enhancements. They've steadily pursued increases to their technology, moving uh, to our most config advanced configurations in PAC-3. You know, just to give examples, which I think are well known to some folks, but in 2011, for example, Saudi Arabia signed a contract to upgrade its 20 Pac-2 configurations to the more advanced Pac-3. Last year, Kuwait also had, uh, announced an intent to purchase four Pac-3 units, including up to 60 missiles and 20 launching statements. And then finally, as Yusuf knows well, it's significant that the very first THAAD customer uh, was UAE. You know, pac includes two THAAD batteries that was valued at over $3.5 billion. So the facts really are clear. These are some of the most advanced and sophisticated platforms. They've been built in response to the threat in the region, and they've shown how we work together to build something up. So that leads me to my second point. Where, where are we now? And I think as we look at where we've come into building up the bilateral capacity, what we want to do is we see the benefits for expanded multilateral cooperation. And when it comes from a difficult area like missile defense with the technological and other considerations, we're clear that it's an evolutionary process, but nevertheless one that's very important. Uh, and it's important for this reason, which is well known to many of you here, that uh, as important as our individual BND efforts are, in particular the geographic distribution, of the, uh, the Gulf and the threat from Iranian ballistic missiles means that uh, sharing the burden of our land and maritime targets and assets for better collaboration, for better sharing of resources, and better division of niche capabilities makes wholehearted sense. That's why we're working through this uh, closely together now. Uh, and I think the logic of cooperation is not just technical, it's political as well. 
And I think on that on two fronts that we've been moving forward. You know, in, in pursuit of some of this common security architecture, CENTCOM has worked closely with our GCC partners on this range of bilateral and multilateral BMD exercises to really uh, improve the efficiency and the competency of our regional uh, missile defense forces. Now, much of this collaboration uh, occurs at the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Center, which I remember visiting uh, at Aldafra, which is an important part of what we're, uh, of what we're doing. You know, this past year, uh, General Goldenfein, the head of AFCENT, has initiated a series of regular liaison exchanges and meetings between U.S. and GCC countries, culminating in liaison officers meeting at the CAOC in Qatar, which is something when you have such a range of partners meeting together, you know, from the outside is something that sounds at a more working level detail, but I think it's really significant in driving us forward and building those key partnerships. And then in addition to this, at the political level, uh, as Secretary Clinton said last March at the inaugural meeting of the Gulf Strategic Forum, uh, she underscored the importance of working together to address the common threat of ballistic missile defense. And as a result of this, I think as Jim Miller might have mentioned this morning, the SCF directed the formation of a BMD working group to help direct and guide some of this BMD cooperation to bring it at the forefront of discussion. So those are the steps we've taken. So the question is, where are we going? And where does lead this now? And, and as I end, I just would probably highlight on, I think, three or four points as we look at, at what we're trying to drive for in the future. Uh, I think first, the United States con continues to have a deep and enduring strategic interest in the Gulf. Uh, it's committed to the region's stability and security, uh, particularly through ballistic missile defense. It's our assets ashore and afloat. And even our 10 deployed Patriot batteries uh, in the Gulf, particularly in this time of budget constraints and competition for resources everywhere, underscores our commitment to that. Um, I think second, very much so, is while bilateral cooperation uh, really has been our primary form of engagement, and I think our bilateral relationships with these countries are as strong as ever and nothing would detract from that. We're also engaging in broad multilateral cooperation to try to suppl supplement this and reinforce these mutually held objectives. But then the thing I'd want to conclude by is, uh, is a point that is often missed. And it's that more is not enough. It is not just about more technology. It is not just about buying more hardware. It's about working together with qualitative changes that we're working together, including expanded capacity building, training, and putting in the context of our overall relationship. It's not just the hardware. It's also the software, both in training as well as the political elements, which we work in close partnership to do together. That, thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. And uh, let me turn to Ambassador Olotaiba. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And first, let me start by thanking the Atlantic Council, and particularly Barry and Ian, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, as you introduced me, you said ambassador and worked for director of international affairs. I'm sure everybody's thinking, why the hell is he here speaking on missile defense? And before I became director of international affairs, my boss was the head of the armed forces. And so uh, I learned, whether I liked it or not, a lot of military issues, and that's why we're here today. We've been looking at enhancing and developing our missile defense program for about a decade now. Uh, and I think I can safely say that today the UAE's missile defense program, which we'll talk about in a bit, is probably one of the most robust in the region, if not the world. In cooperation with our friends here in the United States, we were the first launch customer for the THAAD missile defense program, and we've also purchased the Patriot program, the PAC-3. So what we're shooting for is a layered missile defense system to protect a small country of 8 million people, but with the second largest economy in the region. If any of you have been to the UAE, you've, you can see that we've built a very open, liberal, tolerant, pluralistic society. So we have absolutely no issues with investing 6 or $7 billion in a missile defense program that will protect the country from the obvious threats that we face in the region. The UAE Missile Defense Program is designed to work in conjunction, not just with us, but with our allies and with our friends in the region. So I am a strong advocate of the engagement with the GCC. I think the US must engage the GCC as a collective organization more, more strongly, and encourage them to do more. If we are ever going to have the opportunity to create a bulwark against Iran, it is going to be through a GCC forum. I think that is something we need to stress more and more. Having said that, the GCC is going to have some challenges. 
what we are asking the GCC to do, behave as almost like a NATO function in terms of missile defense or military cooperation, has never been done before. So GCC is still trying to figure out how to do that. I think we need to encourage them, I think we need to push them, and I think we need to show them what the advantages of multilateral cooperation versus bilateral. The reason there is still a little bit of reluctance on the part of the GCC is everyone is afraid that the multilateral cooperation is going to come at the expense of the bilateral cooperation. So as we were chatting earlier, I think it's important for countries particularly like us who have already done a significant amount in building a missile defense system for our country that multilateral cooperation is not going to come at the expense of your co our cooperation with the US. It's not going to come at the expense of how far we've come. When you move at the pace of six countries, you're naturally going to move slower than at the pace of one country. So I think we have to find a formula that addresses this. What the general fear is, uh, is that if we wait for everyone to come on board, to buy the equipment, to do the training, to purchase the software, you will put countries like the UAE at risk because they've already done an incredible amount on this program. So I think we need to figure out a mechanism where there's a bilateral system of cooperation, and once everyone is on board, there is a multilateral system of cooperation. Politically speaking, I think there's a lot of opportunities to engage the GCC on. Whether it's the Iranian nuclear threat, whether it's the Iranian behavior in the region, whether it's the activities of the Arab Spring over the last two years, today the GCC is as cohesive and as united as it's ever been. And I think politically, not just militarily, we need to engage the GCC in that level. We've seen them perform very capably on the Yemen issue. We're seeing them take a strong position on the Iran issue. And we're seeing, with various levels of success, addressing the Syria issue. But basically, what I am advising is that the GCC can be a strong partner for the United States, both politically and militarily. It is not without its challenges, but I think it's something we must continue to do. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, now I'll turn to Admiral Cosgrove. Well, thank you. I, I, I understand completely both the countries, I think, the two countries' positions on this. And I don't disagree with the general thrust of the policy nor the difficulty of the politics of the region. But I would say, before we get too far into this, we shouldn't gloss over the technical challenges that await us. And uh, even beyond the technical ones, what I would consider to be cultural and procedural ones. Uh, we know that uh, the UAE, for instance, has gotten best of breed in the systems they bought from the United States. Uh, what we don't know and what the ambassador just asked us to consider is how do we move the entire GCC forward in as coherent a manner as his own country has moved, and that's a tall order. I think it's important to understand also that at the end of the day, we're, we are still trying to deter the likely threat, meaning Iran, from, from either even more uh, difficult positions uh, beyond the very difficult ones they've already taken. And that to have real deterrence requires this capability be built out thoroughly and completely and some of the other things we've talked about this morning. I'll, I'll leave all the highly technical discussion to Mr. Slocum, who apparently is better versed in the, in the esoteric of missile interceptors uh, based on his comments this morning. But it is important that we, we, we base our thinking on the technical realities of missile defense. Uh, I think in, in terms of putting it in context, uh, also the GCC is 32 years old. That's half the age of NATO. And they've come an awful long way, and they've come an awful long way since I've left the region, I'm not suggesting causality, but they're a long way since I left four or five years ago, and especially the UAE, second to none in uh, bolstering the both individual countries' security and that of the region. I should say before we go any further, uh, since I am now a private citizen, uh, these views are mine, not the United States Navy's, nor are they textrons. We have no business in the ballistic missile defense field, although we do do business in the region. One of the things that uh, 
we need to bear in mind all the time when we're thinking about this, and it's reflected to some extent by the, by the poster to my right, and that this really is rocket science. This is hard stuff. It's hard at every possible level, just like it's hard on every stage of that interceptor. It's hard aboard an Aegis ship. It's hard in the control room of a TIPI-2 radar. It's hard in the command centers at whatever level of command you need to abstract this to get success. And it's a big problem in that it stretches from Oman to essentially the, the coastal Kuwait and Iraq. And that's, roughly speaking, a defended front of some thousand nautical miles, if you, if you were to look at it and sketch it out. What does that mean from the threat point of view? It means that a coastal launched short range ballistic missile from Iran can range Riyadh and be there in a handful of minutes. You can't get at it during its entire flight. It's moving in, the, in excess of uh, multiple, multiple miles per second. It is a hard target. You're hitting a bullet with a bullet. Uh, at those speeds, and you're waiting till the end of its flight to make that engagement. The weapons are accurate enough. These are not Iraqi scuds. The weapons are accurate enough that chances are they will land within their weapons effect area, even if they are outside their notional uh, calculated error probable. So I don't want to belabor it, but, but this very real reality underpins everything we're talking about today. Now, the larger problem in my mind, pushing the I believe button for a minute that you can solve all the technical ones, and I think they're solvable, uh, the larger problem is the integration of different systems into a coherent missile defense architecture that also involve different countries. And they, they involve countries, as the ambassador said, that really don't have a, a, a culture of deep military collaboration. In fact, in some instances, just the opposite. So you have to, uh, un we have to understand that this is going to take time. And the indispensable reality of the current approach is that the United States of America is the integrating agent of all these countries. Now, I'm partial. I think these countries should buy American. Uh, for no other reason than it's a lot easier to integrate stuff that's already been integrated over here. Uh, but at the end of the day, at least if it's a NATO standard, uh, we can architect it into a coherent system. It does have to be layered, although for the most part, uh, these are terminal phase intercepts. Uh, there's virtually no uh, realistic uh, exoatmospheric problem in the region as it exists today. Virtually none, not done. Uh, one commenter opined when talking about missile defense in the region is that in addition to all the technical issues being solved, uh, we have to anticipate unambiguous rules of engagement among six countries, seven counting the United States and maybe other allies, and you have to have pre-delegated decision making in order to be effective. So in my mind, that information sharing, sensor data sharing, procedural understanding and agreement uh, must be built into the architecture from the bottom up. They, it is every bit as important as the physical communication links that would underpin that. This amounts to second party decision making for a sovereign state to be effective. It could, it could, could mean that. So the question is in a, in a not too hypothetical scenario, if the best interceptor would be fired from a guitar or a Kuwait battery against a defended asset in another country, who makes that decision? And how do they make that decision? And are they empowered to make that decision in practical ways? These are sticky sovereignty issues that have to be worked through. And I know the two gentlemen to my right certainly know that and are working on it. Uh, this morning, Mr. Slocum also talked about uh, exercise expense. Well, once you buy all this stuff and it isn't cheap, you do have to exercise it and you have to exercise it in as realistic a fashion as possible and you should exercise it with the people that actually 
need to use the systems in combat and not the pros from Dover. And so that means you have to create all the infrastructure either there or ship things over here to do it to support that testing. And that will run to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars as, as was pointed out. Lastly, uh, as, I, as I briefly mentioned, is the deterrent value of this investment worthwhile? I, if I were to put myself in Tehran, in a situation I hypothetically did a couple of times, uh, would I be deterred by the missile defense architect architecture that I see in the Gulf today? And I think the short answer to that is no. Uh, it's backed up by credible military capability, uh, offensive capability by the United States principally and other allies, but nonetheless, defense itself in the current uh, structure, with, with some possible exceptions for some defended areas, uh, wouldn't deter me. I don't think that should keep us from building out a more robust national level architectures in the, in the region than a multilateral one really falling in on a US based uh, system of systems. But that'll take time. I, I was struck by the timeline of the, of the EPAA, the most sophisticated militaries in the world, and it's gonna take us another half decade to build out the European phased adaptive approach much of which rests on technical challenge. And certainly the phase four is, is uh, well grounded in technical challenge. So paradoxically, by the way, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, as one of the questions this morning tried to draw out from the undersecretary, uh, what does that do to this, this deterrent equation? I think it makes missile defense more important. It also makes, it, more important for our regional allies to keep them from going across the threshold would be my assessment of that. So I'll stop there and look forward to any questions we may have during the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Admiral, and thank you uh, to all our panelists. I'm gonna ask uh, each of the panelists a question before I open it up uh, more broadly to the audience for questions. Uh, and, and, this, and I'm gonna ask them all at once and you should feel free to uh, respond to something I ask someone else, but, uh, uh, but I have sort of specific questions in mind for each of you. Um, so first, uh, to, uh, to Matt, to Dr. Spence, you know, the, you mentioned the, the sort of goal of multilateralism when you mentioned where we are going forward. And, I, and I'm curious how you see the end state of this uh, cooperation with the GCC. Is it something like a joint missile shield with the U.S. and the GCC? Is it self-sufficiency for the GCC? Uh, and then how, can you, how do you tie in other countries in the region where we have similar investments but aren't really part of this conversation in a direct way. So Iraq, for example, is not really part of this conversation but is one of the original pillars of the Gulf security dialogue. Uh, Turkey, Israel, uh, where we just had, uh, where we have this austere challenge exercise which the Gulf countries are not a part of, for example. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to sort of how, how the U.S. sees all this tying together and where we see the end state. Uh, for uh, Ambassador Al Taiba. Um, I, would, I would ask you the same question. How, how do you see the end state here uh, in, in terms of what you're driving towards? And then how are you concerned about the role of the United States in that? Obviously here in Washington there are a lot of debates about the defense budget, about the sustainability of uh, our presence in the region. We've had the withdrawal from Iraq, a recent withdrawal of an aircraft carrier from the Gulf. Uh, so how, how do you think about the U.S. role in your own missile defense? Uh, and then for Admiral Cosgriff, I want to ask, push on you a little bit on this question of the threat, um, because that's, of course, what's looming in the background here. This isn't just being done uh, for the sake of doing it. It's being done because there's a threat. Uh, and you mentioned that Iran would not be deterred uh, by what we have now. Uh, and I'm curious if you could just uh, expand on that a little bit. In particular, um, I'm, I'm curious about whether you feel that Iran's, the size of Iran's missile and also rocket arsenal uh, would simply overwhelm uh, the missile defenses in this region. Uh, and I'm also curious as to what, what's the role for uh, the offensive side of missile defense. Somebody, I think, Matt, you mentioned the, uh, the Gulf War. Uh, one of the things we didn't probably do in the Gulf War to the extent we needed to was to destroy the missiles before they were launched. That's something that I think Israel did with greater success in the 2006 Hezbollah War. Um, to what extent are we uh, where we should be on the offensive side of, of uh, being able to, in the event of a conflict, uh, destroy missiles before they're launched. So I, I don't know, Matt, do you want to start? Sure. 
Uh, so I think on the, the, the vision of what we're looking for, uh, working towards is this, as we talked about, is continuing to uh, ensure, I think as, as Yusuf uh, spoke well, is that we have the best capabilities are provided to countries as they're ready to do it and taking the steps to be able to make the, do that and that we are not slowing things down as we wait for greater pieces to come together. As we're looking to still do is recognize is that this is an area with a huge amount of threats and a limited amount of uh, BMD assets right now to as much as we can work towards leveraging the pieces that we can to work larger synergies, synergies larger burden sharing, and larger best allocation of resources uh, right now. And the context that we're trying to do this is the broader context of supporting uh, closer Gulf cooperation on the range of threats of BMD as just one. There's maritime security. There are the threats we're working for joint exercises and all together. The question of how does our GCC efforts interact with Israel or Iraq or, or uh, Turkey is we view them uh, in the same way holistically in a sense. That, that they are not uh, in a competition for resources right now, uh, that they evolve together and that as you look at some of the same, same threats, take Iran for example, an exercise uh, in closer cooperation assets in Iraq or in Turkey or in Israel all send a same message of defense in the same efforts that we're seeing in, in the GCC. So we see them as evolving and mutually reinforcing. I, I agree with Matt, and I think I would look at it this way. Our ideal outcome in missile defense, regional missile defense, is that the UAE has its program. Our neighbors have their programs. We are, we're going to have two TPY2 radars, which are the THAAD radars. Another country is discussing another purchase of it. So as countries develop it, their defense systems and mechanisms, we have two options of how to proceed. Either we can fold in a regional architecture as each one joins into the group, or we wait till everyone is, has their systems and then we flip a switch and everyone's integrated into one common architecture. I think that's, that's a question that is open for discussion, but at the end of the day, I think the final outcome needs to be a regional missile defense architecture with interceptors and sensors linked to each other. In a perfect world, and I would take it one step further, there's always at least one carrier battle group in the Gulf these days, occasionally two. There's a lot of Aegis destroyers out there with very capable radars that at some point we would love to be able to link in to give us a bigger view and an earlier uh, heads up if something gets launched. So in, in an ideal world, we're talking about six national linked def missile, missile defense systems potentially linked with US assets on the ground that will give us a tremendous amount of deterrent capability. But as Admiral Koskov was saying, I think this is a very important military uh, message to send, but it's an even more important political message to send. As you noted earlier, Mike, there's, there's those in the region who, who question US commitment to the region. Um, they see the US withdrawing from Iraq. They see the US about to withdraw from Afghanistan. They see a pivot to Asia. They see no involvement in Syria, and they ask themselves, is the US really going to be there if we need them? This is compounded by the energy uh, argument, where the US is going to be the largest energy producer in the world. And people say if they don't need uh, energy from the Gulf, are they going to be there for us when we need them? So having this type of architecture, having this type of coordination, not just bilaterally, but multilaterally, tells people that, yes, the U.S. will be there. Can I ask you just a quick follow-up, Yusuf, before, uh, Admiral, you give your answer. Is there a role for other suppliers uh, in the GCC? Is there a role for Russia? Is there a role for China uh, in uh, the, the theater missile defense in the GCC region? I think there has to be an opportunity for everyone. I don't think anyone can say, we're only going to deal with this. But the fact is, today, U.S. military technology is superior to any other technology out there. And if we are talking ultimately about an end game where regional architecture is the goal, it's going to be very difficult to integrate a THAAD with a Chinese radar. It's just they don't talk the same way. And so if, everyone on board, if everyone's on board with that goal, I think we're not going to have a problem with people looking at other suppliers. I think people look at other suppliers to hedge their bets. And it's, it's a fair you know, mechanism to use. But I think today, if you look at what the US is able to provide versus what other countries are able to provide in terms of technical superiority, there's no competition. Mike, I think you, you touched on the, the, the nub of the problem from a military point of view, and it is saturation. 
And there's no perfect defense. If you want to launch everything at one thing, something's going to get through. That's just you know facts of, of life. Uh, and I think we need to credit the likely adversary with the ability to coordinate at least launch times or first approximations to create some amount of local saturation. If you step back a little bit, though, uh, some of the things that the ambassador touched on, you know, early warning, that's a U.S. capability right now against that, that target country uh, until uh, either UAE or Aegis picks up the, the missile and boost phase. There's, there's a time there that information is available. I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's the ability to, to network, as, as, uh, as was said, uh, and, and not only the ability, the need to because of the number of missiles. I think it's illustrative that uh, military people always say it's better to shoot the archer than it is to shoot the arrow. We just don't have any, any basis of success with which to make that statement in ballistic missiles. We didn't do especially well in Gulf 1. And uh, I credit the Israelis with Iron Dome against the rocket attacks, but they came up against the other part of the problem, which is magazine depth. And I, was, I would say that right now that we have a magazine depth issue in uh, the current number of ballistic missile defense uh, interceptors, as well as a coverage issue. The coverage is being built out. The sensors are there. Essentially, if we, if we had a completely coherent system of systems right now, you would have all the radar systems linked today, and you would cover that 1,000-mile front. Flat statement. but. Uh, we have a ways to go to get there. And then you have the procedural challenges of making decisions in that compressed period of time from, from apogee until impact. And, and that's sporting. It's sporting against a jet moving at Mach. And it's a lot more sporting when you get into three and four or five Mach. And is there a military cost, I'm curious, uh, just to follow up, to the approach that Matt and Yusuf described, you know, the, the kind of uh, bilateral multilateralism where you have some countries ahead of others. Would it be better from a military point of view to have a uh, kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, integrated but maybe less advanced system to take on the, the threat that we're talking about? Or, is, or is, this, is this approach fine from a military point of view? I think it is what it is. I, you know, you can't build a perfect world. I think the front runners should keep running and they should integrate with us faster and we should encourage that. Uh, because that is credible military power, which does add to your deterrent factor. And it certainly helps the country that's, that's shouldering the, the bill for their own people. Great. Well, with that, why don't we take questions uh, from the audience? And if you just uh, stick up your hand, and, and when you're asking your question, please stand up and say where you're from. So the, the first question back there. Thank you. Bilal Saab, uh, director of Enigma North America. If I could just follow up on the uh, military component of this puzzle, um, and how to overwhelm, basically, a missile defense system. We're all familiar of several ways, whether it's missile salvos or uh, decoys. But what concerns me most is MIRV technology. Could any of you gentlemen comment on Iranian capabilities in MIRV? The good news is they haven't really, they're not near that technology yet. But perhaps project over the next few years whether they could develop that. Thank you. <laughs> I think probably the short answer is, is they probably could, but I'm not sure they will or they need to necessarily against the Gulf, which are basically short-range ballistic missiles, some lesser-range, medium-range missiles at the most. They're not going to be firing the sorts of higher altitude, longer-range things that would typically lend themselves to MERS, for which the EPAA uh, uh, I think anticipates that sort of thing, just like the national system here in this country anticipates that. Uh, you asked about offensive actions, and I think we just have to assume that, that prior to hostilities, perhaps, and certainly at hostilities, there will be offensive action. And it, it will be uh, of the nature that does go after the archer, but not necessarily assuming you'll get all of these archers, but you'll get a lot more of the other ones. And, uh, or, or as we used to say, their day two is going to be a lot worse than our day one. 
<laughs> so the, the, there is a deterrent value to what the secretary was talking about of, of this multi-layered, multiple domain approach to things. It's just that I think in missile defense, uh, we can go faster. We, the United States, we, the countries in the GCC. There's a question here to the left. Uh, Andrew Pierre, Global Insight. Um, in the discussion about Iran possibly developing a nuclear weapon, um, there's a related discussion about the likelihood of proliferation therefore proceeding in the Middle East and the Gulf in general. I think the, if I heard correctly, the ambassador uh, saying earlier that uh, if Iran had nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia wouldn't be far behind. But I'd be interested in the assessment of, um, of the panel regarding how we ought to be, how much we ought to be concerned about proliferation in the Middle East in general, beyond the Gulf, perhaps including Egypt and other countries, should Iran develop an actual weapon? Um, I, I haven't said previously if, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, then any specific country will probably get theirs, but I will say this now. If Iran does get a nuclear weapon, it is, it is very conceivable that many countries in the region will want to get a nuclear weapon for sheer deterrence of their own. And just take a look at what's happening in the Koreas today to give you an example. And that's just a bilateral issue. I think if, if a country lives in the neighborhood that we live in, and Iran, a country of 80 million people, acquires a nuclear weapon, many people will feel far more comfortable getting their own nuclear weapons. That is not an unreasonable notion. notion. But the other piece of proliferation that we, you know, we think about academically is once Iran gets their nuclear weapon, how do we know who it's going to give the technology to? How do we know it's not going to go to Hezbollah? How do we know it's not going to go into Lebanon or into Gaza? And I think there, there's two levels of proliferation we need to be concerned about which is the Iranian proliferation, but also the proliferation of nuclear technology in an already very, very tense and unstable region. Let me, let me flip this question around a little bit uh, and maybe pose a question to you, Matt, which is, you know, uh, Admiral Cosgrave talked before about the Iranian perspective on this. Well, I imagine that Iran looks at sort of the billions of dollars of arms sales in the region and uh, considers that a, a threat from its perspective. We're engaged in nuclear talks right now with the Iranians. Could you ever envision the U.S.? Well, will this, any of this change if we make an agreement with the Iranians? Is any of this, could you envision it being on the table either in phase one, two, three, or four of P5 plus one talks with Iran? What being on the table? The U.S., the U.S. The, the, missile defense? The missile defense with the GCC states, the, the military relationship with the GCC states. You know, I think, I think just to take a step back, Mike, and, and put it in context, is the United States has built partnerships with uh, our Gulf allies before the Iran threat. The Iran threat leading to the creation of the GCC itself has, of course, intensified the cooperation that we work together. But I think as we look towards what we're trying to do, just also to underscore what Yusuf said is, you know, the president's policy has been clear, as our policy is prevention uh, for Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. And the reason why is in addition to the threat of proliferation, is the threat of a nuclear weapon would allow, enable Iran about the other elements of threat, be it their ballistic missile program, be it their destabilizing activities uh, around the world, you know, shown most recently by the plot uh, in the Bulgarian bus, uh, bus bombing that the Bulgarian government revealed. It's not limited to a single threat. So I think the issue of if, they're, if we're being in the P5 plus 1 negotiations is uh, elements that we're taking to secure the Gulf state, the security of the Gulf states on the table, that's, that's premature and I think not the right way of framing it in the sense that we believe that there's still time for diplomacy to succeed in pushing to do that. I think our strong diplomatic isolation of Iran, our strong posture, increases the incentives for Iran to come to the table. But our relationship is the security for the Gulf. And I think we're working together to make sure that we can take steps to defend against and deter the Iranian threat. But it's not something that we trade away in the security of our closest partners, but work together and see them as, as being mutually reinforcing as we go along. In the middle. I think there's a mic right behind you. Okay, yep. Thank you. Um, there have been different assessments of the success rate of the Iron Dome uh, system. 
Some are as high as 85% success, others are as low as 5%. Can anyone on the panel uh, g give us uh, uh, an assessment of, 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 of how successful that system is? Any Iron Dome experts on the panel? <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I'm a qualified <laughs> person to ask, answer that. I mean, I wouldn't say, uh, without getting into the debates over, over the numbers of that, speaking, uh, you know, speaking anecdotally about this, I think Iron Dome has been extraordinarily successful. And I think really is a testament to what, uh, you know, I think to the Obama administration's commitment, not just to Israel security, but also the regional security, because it has created more decision space for the Israeli government to defend against the rocket threat. I can only speak from, from personal experience going to some of these. I think. Uh, when I was in Israel in March of last year, one of the first things I did is go to an Iron Dome battery. And there's a young commander who's there who uh, is much younger than anyone would expect. And this was after there was another barrage of rocket fire from Gaza. I arrived about three days after that happened. And that particular Iron Dome battery, just asking them with no one around and no sort of sense I was getting data, his particular battery hit 20 out of 20 in what they had fired right now. And I know when Secretary Panetta went to an Iron Dome battery in July of last year, with uh, Minister Barack, they talked about the, you know, the, the extraordinary rate of success, which was over 80%. I think in some sense, parsing the numbers that sometime in between is missing the actual issue, that this is something that is a new technology that we've developed in collaboration with the Israelis that has created decision space and has saved concrete lives. And as we work in this difficult budget environment to continue to work to support that, it's been something that's guaranteed both Israeli security and American security, and I think relates to the to the panel that we're talking about. In Israel, at least, it's part of a layered amount of US security that we're providing. It's our known for short-term rockets, as, as your question implied. It's the David Sling program, and it's the Aero program. And I think, Mike, this gets to a question that you had asked earlier, is how do these different efforts fit in? They are mutually reinforcing about creating decision space for governments to guard against persistent threats that are only proliferating and working together, I think, in collaboration, as Iron Dome is a, is a great example of to try to advance that technology and address what is a very, very problem where you always have fewer defenses than you have offensive capabilities. But I think Iron Dome has showed what can happen when we work together in that technology. I would only caveat that it's the, it's the new base case and the other side will improve the accuracy of their mm -hmm. rockets. Great, more questions. Over here. You with your hand up. Jeffrey Lynn from Senator Angus King's office. I was wondering if that, given things like naval BMD, well, the Aegis BMD would be more multi role than, say, that, that perhaps it would be a greater deterrent value for, say, the GCC to buy Aegis warships, for example, as opposed to investing primarily in land-based surface-to-air missile batteries? If you'll sell them to us, sure. <laughs> no, we're, we're interested in having a robust capability, whether it's land-based, whether it's naval-based. We are looking at all options. Right now, we are looking at starting off with a land-based system and hopefully developing that into either linking with the U.S. or potentially buying U.S. technology for ourselves. But I, I, I have a hard, hard time believing that the U.S. will release the sale of Aegis destroyers or Aegis technology right now to the Gulf. I think even if, even if they would, uh, it, it, it's an added layer of complexity uh, and it could distract, uh, distract the uh, governments from what they can attain in the near term, which would be land-based ballistic missile defense with respect to all the shipbuilders who might <laughs> who will take me off their Christmas card list now. <laughs> uh, I, I want to I ask a follow-up question to something which uh, Admiral Cosgrove mentioned towards the end of his last answer, which is, you know, the other side responds in a sense. They're adapting as well. Um, so obviously we've talked here about a program which for the last 10 years has been growing tremendously. Um, I, I don't know, Yusuf or, or Admiral Cosgrove or Matt, frankly, any of you, can any, any of you comment on the Iranian response? Have we seen uh, have we seen Iran adapting uh, to this uh, deterrent which we've put in place? Uh, or how might we expect them to adapt in the future? Would we expect, for example, uh, to create an additional incentive here for proxy attacks or for asymmetric uh, or terrorist attacks? Uh, and how do, you, how do we sort of factor that into what we're doing? Well, I don't think 
they, they would want to try to match strength, what their perceived strength is, which is a number of, of ballistic missiles against a really strong defense system. So that in, to some extent, the GCC and the U.S. as, a, as an integral team will achieve some level of, of deterrent capability. I can't quantify that, but I think you, you understand what I'm getting at. So that will, that will suggest to me based on their past record of behavior that they will go for other ways of creating nuisance and, and if they really wanted to inflict harm they may turn to something like Hezbollah or Quds Force, uh, truly unconventional of attacks or what we call unconventional. They've, they've become so conventional they aren't unconventional anymore. I think the two threats we always look at from Iran is the conventional military threat, fast attack boats, uh, amphibious landings, missile, defense, missile, missile launches. The unconventional threat, as Admiral Cosgrove mentioned, is the, the, the Hezbollah, the IRGC, the soft, the soft targets, the terrorism. At any given day, I think the ratio between the two threats varies, depending on what the climate is. But in our, in our assessments and in our intelligence, we, we have to assume that both of those are going to come at us. And we have to be able to protect the country from both types of threats on any given day. Um, how exactly it'll play out, I don't think anyone knows, but we look at both scenarios very carefully and try to protect against both. More questions? Yes, Ian. talk about NATO missile defense and the capabilities that are developing, there is an expeditionary dimension to it. When you think about the systems that are being introduced in, into or, and exist in, in the GCC, things like Patriot, which are mobile systems, what thinking is going on in the region about applying and developing those capacities, not just for territorial defense, but for more of a global role that GCC could play? For example, in the contribution some GCC has made to for example, in Libya? No, it's, a, it's a great question. I think that's something that we will think about in the future. But today, given our situation, given our threat level, and given, given the situation with Iran, I think we need all the assets that we can for, for ourselves. Our expeditionary commitments have been more in transportation, fighter, fighter aircraft, um, special forces. You know, we have approximately 1,500 people in Afghanistan today. We have six Chinook helicopters, we have six F-16 fighter jets, and we have some other you know, assets d throughout the country. In Libya, we, we gave 12 aircraft and a special forces contingent. So depending on the type of operation, depending on the requirement, we're happy to contribute what assets we have to spare. But at this point, I don't think whether it's sensors or interceptors in the missile defense field, we have anything to spare given the threat. Um, maybe one day that we'll be able to move something like a THAAD battery and move it into Libya or move it into Syria, but we're not there yet today. I think it's a, that's an interesting point. I mean, I, it, it's an interesting forward-looking question, which is good to think about. And just to build on what Yusuf said is, it is, if you take a step back and just look at what the GCC was formed to do and the United States' role in it, it's interesting that you are seeing things, even the Libya operation, which we mentioned. You know, the Libya operation, to have an operation that began, that started off with an Arab League resolution, you know, something that was not, that we hit a coalition which had meaningful, and I mean very meaningful support from partners like the UAE, uh, that were looking not just to defend the United States assets in the region, not just our partners there, not just the airmen and women and American service members at Al Dafra or, or places like that, but actually not just US assets, to look beyond, I think, is part of the project that as much as we talk about how far the GCC still has to go, as far as political cooperation, the steps that we've taken and been there. I mean, it's interesting, even at a, again, at, at a smaller level, I'm thinking on, on March 4th of this year, you know, the, the combined uh, Air Operations Center, these liaison officers who met together at the CAA, came together and uh, produced an air tasking order, you know, that was used as a joint exercise that we had together. So something small, when you talk about the types of collaboration that is, that is possible, to stick with it and to move forward and to talk about the levels that we can move forward, I think, is something that we're very focused on as we look forward about what, what can be possible as this cooperation continues to mature. 
I agree with that because of the, the human capital that has to go into to mastering these skills. Shouldn't, we really haven't talked about it, but you know, this is graduate level work at every level. And I, I'm taken by what Under Secretary Miller said this morning, and I think this, just turn it around. That the measure of merit for, for a pick on the UAE, for the UAE is defending their homeland. You know, everything else is secondary to that. So they, they enter into st strategic, from their point of view, regional agreements, military agreements, and, and we become a regional partner in that. So to my shipbuilding friends, what do we bring? Well, we bring truly mobile platforms with, with firepower and sensors. We, as a country, we bring early warning. We bring command and control. Build on that. And I think, we'll, and what can we expect the regional countries to do? Additional sensors, launchers, and missiles. And those are very good, doable steps. I don't know Raytheon or whoever would be happy to hear me say this, but those are things that these countries should do and should do more of them, and they should follow UAE's lead in that respect. Sir. really ask you to step into a metaphysical minefield. Supposing at the end of the day, the United States has no other option except to attack Iran. What are some of the unintended consequences that you think might arise? Who wants to tackle this one? <laughs> <laughs> Unintended consequences. I don't know if they're all that unintended. I think you're going to get attacked someplace else, maybe uncomfortably close to home, if not home, for the United States. Uh, certainly, uh, it would be taken as more more than likely causes belly against Israel by Hezbollah or other surrogates. Uh, it could result in in a, in a truly escalatory step launching something towards Europe. Um, so it's, whatever you think, my opinion, whatever my experience, whatever you think that the current regime of Iran is capable of, just multiply it by something because they're, they're really capable of some strange behavior. Yusuf, when, when your country or the other UCC countries are thinking about this, um, are, are you guys operating on the assumption that if either the U.S. or Israel uh, does undertake an attack against Iran, that your countries will be targets for retaliation against Iran? Uh, and do you think that the sort of amount of uh, cooperation, all these sites, you know, for, for example, that, you, that we've created around missile defense, uh, has that actually increased the chance that Iran will target uh, those places? If you live 100 miles away from Iran, your population is one-tenth of theirs. You're implementing the sanctions that are hurting them. You come up with no other possibility than to say, yes, we are going to be at their, within their target sites. Whether we're involved, whether we're not involved, we're going to be in one of those categories of targeting. I think, to, just to to continue what Admiral Cosgrove was saying, I think there's three categories of targets should the U.S. strike Iran. And I think you're going to look at Western interests, I think you're going to look at Israeli interests, and I think you're going to look at Gulf interests. And depending on how easy or difficult or reachable those targets are, they will make those decisions. I, 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 we assume that we are going to be targeted. And what do you think about the argument, uh, for example, um, that if, for example, Israel attacks Iran, that Iran won't want to retaliate against the U.S. or U.S. allies in order to avoid sort of escalating the conflict even further. I think I would defer this one to, <laughs> to some of my colleagues. I'm not sure, sure. I, I know the answer to that. I mean, I, I think the thing I would, I would say as we've made clear is, the, is uh, you know, the United States uh, commitment has, has been clear and I think repeated, repeated repeatedly by the President and others that I think we're aware and very clear-eyed and closely tracking monitoring the multi-dimensional threat that Iran presents. Uh, we've made the consequences clear of the choice that the Iranian government has made. And, and I know this is something that there are many people here who used to work at the Defense Department. So this is a familiar mantra as we plan for all contingencies. And we're preparing to look at the different things that could result should this happen. 
All right. Well, I think that's just about the time that we have for this panel. And I think uh, one thing that emerges from this is just the extent to which missile defense in the Gulf has become a pillar for U.S. security policy in this region. So thanks very much to the panelists for their perspectives. Uh, and thanks to all of you. I think, uh, Ian, you have something to say before we conclude? Of course, we thank the panel. Just an administrative note. Uh, we're going to take a break for half an hour. And at 1 o'clock, we're going to have a hard start for a keynote conversation with Ellen Tauscher and Steve, and Steve Hadley and, and, and Fred Kemp. So I encourage you, after we break, grab your food, bring it back in here so we can start at 1 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>